Thanks for joining. I'm here to talk about Filecoin economics. The internet is in the middle of a revolution. Over four and a half years, years ago today, that was the opening line in the Filecoin white paper. I'm happy to report that that's still the case. E economies have various aspects. They grow, they contract, they expand, they decay. They have many components with many players. It'll be challenging to be comprehensive in an hour and just talk about every aspect of the Filecoin economy. But what we're going to do now is give you the principles and the tools to understand what, what the key parts are, how to learn more, and how to be successful as a storage provider. So here what we have is sort of my other way, my initial aspect of understanding crypto economics, Web3, the sort of current state of the internet. This is uh, taken from an article in The Economist, uh, came out in the end of 2021, and I have like no idea what's going on. Right? I think the, the hand is the government, big brother, Elizabeth Warren, pick your political opponent, it's probably one of them. There are cannons that have circuit boards for wheels. It's very evocative, everything looks like cigars, if you're Freud. Um, I think they are firing you know, lawyers out of the cannons, which depending on how much you deal with them is either great or terrible or amazing. Um, but as you can see, it's confusing and no one necessarily has a clear line of sight because as we sort of said at the beginning of the white paper, it's a revolution. Everything is changing very quickly. And what I hope to do, what we hope to do in ESPA, is give you a better sense or a sure footing for what's going on. That's the way I helped, that's the way it helped me learn. And hopefully that's the way it helped you learn. So here's an executive summary of Filecoin. I gotta imagine if you're Andy Jassy or if you're Satya Nadella, you're probably not as thrilled with this, but it just gives you a quick nutshell and like a graphic and a couple words of what we aim to accomplish. You can see that end users, customers, purchase Filecoin to storage files, right? You, we have to post collateral with storage providers. We receive it as block rewards, right? And then eventually we store or receive our customers' data. Now there are a couple of challenges with this. There's some things that make it difficult or hard. Um, some of them are physical, right? I'd say just there's a supply chain constraint going on right now in early 2022. It's just hard to get any sort of silicon-based equipment. Right? No matter where you are in the supply chain, it's just difficult. There's some financial barriers to entry. Collateral is super expensive, right? That's something we hope to solve, right? But there's also one that we're speaking to right now, which is there's a significant learning curve. Filecoin is not necessarily intuitive, even though it's powerful. That's something I hope we address, and hopefully we bring everyone up along the learning curve a little bit. So here on the next slide is sort of the way that I thought about understanding Filecoin when I first was approached it you know, a while ago. In pandemic years, it's a very, very long time ago. But um, sort of the profitability drivers in the network. The, my best way of understanding something as someone on the finance team is through a P&L. How does something make money? Is it profitable? Does it make economic sense? So the way I think about it is just break it down into revenue and costs, and then further break it down into what I can control as a storage provider or as a business and what I can't control. Now, I come from the energy industry, renewable, so don't worry, um, and there are lots of things you couldn't necessarily control. Like I said, the price of Filecoin, hardware costs, supply chain issues, how big block rewards are, but there are certain things I can control. What, differentiary, what differentiates me from other people? What are my prices? What are my labor costs? Right, All those things matter, and you can see, as I see in the above, reduce it to a simple statement. The fees I charge to customers and end users, right, plus my block rewards times the Filecoin price, minus all those relevant costs, becomes a simple way to, to understand it. It's like the way I did. So let's go through the Filecoin specification. So the Filecoin specification, as you can see on the link there, is a primary resource. It's a large living document. And it's something that has various technical, economic, it's just more, it's a very, very long comprehensive store, uh, document that has a lot of useful information on it. If you're here for ESPA, or if you're listening along, it's definitely worth your time to go visit that link and read through it. So this is one of the areas, as I was first coming, as I was first learning about Filecoin, that can seem intimidating at first. It's large, tons of links, different colors, things are in various statuses, but it's a great way to start your journey. And what I have here on the slide are just a couple sections that I found were really useful when I was learning. 
There are areas that are some fundamental, kind of like blockchain, token, and then even more economic and, and more expensive, like storage mining markets. Um, this is a good area and a good reference document, even though it's living and on the web, to use as you sort of learn more. As you march up that learning curve, constantly come back to it, refer to it, you know, read it. Um, if you have trouble sleeping sometimes, keep going for it. Like it's great, but it's, it's definitely not as boring as I would have just made it out to be. It's a great place to learn more and to keep growing as you learn. So here's just a sense of the Filecoin ecosystem. As I was updating this slide, as we were making these, these materials, this was a great slide to always update because it was always getting bigger. From the storage capacity to the number of developers to the number of applications, everything has always just kept growing. It's made it hard to keep up, but it also is thrilling to know that you're a part of something that's growing. So outside of that, outside of these three large metrics, there are other use cases, both for archival storage, decentralized videos, but also even outside of Filecoin. Humanity's appetite and production of data is growing. That's a good thing. So here we're at sort of at sort of Filecoin, the economy and utility tokens. Now that sort of separates it out, especially as I learned, or as, as we're talking about, it means that the, the token itself becomes a way, like it's something that you use. It's not just something that has intrinsic value or that is a meme or that you can right click and save, right? The token holders, you know, sort of, it gives you access to the network and lets you use it. I think that's important. And that, that's what differentiates it in my mind from other things, from other protocols. So one of the, a big analogy for Filecoin, for other areas as well, is that Filecoin is kind of like an island economy. So like we said, using the token gives you the right to use the network, but it also means that when everyone comes together, developers, storage providers, researchers, um, the island creates something and exports it to the world, right? That's storage, right? The way it does it is gonna look different, right? The way it'll do will change over time, like any economy, Right? Think of the US, Chinese, the world economy. It looks vastly different over time than when it first began. But they always produce some sort of useful good, something that is demanded by the outside world. Right? In our case, it's storage, both in storage markets, retrieval markets. As we get further along in the presentation, we'll go through and look at that more. So this is a pentagram, I promise. Um, it's not your typical one kind of trusting everyone's ability to read. Um, this comes from a 2020 presentation that I thought was quite good. Um, Juan Bennett, ZX Zhang, other members of Protocol Labs have talked about it as well. And this is called Engineering Filecoin's Economy. It's a great read. It's about like 30, 35 pages, totally also worth your time. It's another reference document along with the specifications that gives you a really strong foundation for what it means to be a storage provider and sort of how to understand the network and the markets and the protocol. Now, the best thing here, or the thing you should take away, is that there are overlapping but distinct areas that you could participate in. You could be a researcher, you could be a storage provider. Miner was the old word, right? Clients, you could be a developer, you can be just a token holder, right? There are many entry points to the economy and many roles to play, but all of them have to benefit, right? For this to be robust, for this to grow. That's why we're here at ESPA. That's what we're aiming to do. Kickstart one of the areas, the storage provider area. So right now, since this is an overview, give you a quick overview of blockchain ledgers, right? You're probably familiar with them through various shapes or forms. Um, again, for timeliness to date this, uh, if you just watched the Super Bowl, you could not have not watched the Super Bowl and had blockchain related or crypto related ads thrown at your face. So to give you a quick overview outside of a QR code that you had to take a picture of or something like that, that took forever to open, just remember that blockchains are something that's trivially easy to verify, but extremely hard to fake, right? And it's a public, open, distributed ledger, right? It's cryptographically secured. So the way that Filecoin does it is not necessarily proof of like proof of work, like computing power or something like other networks, right? They have proof of storage. It's sort of your contribution to the network in terms of storage power. And that's really useful. That's really unique, I'd say. So that storage, as you can see on this slide, takes it takes you know the form of two areas. Proof of replication, so that means you've given me my data and I'm storing it on the network and I've proved that. I've proved that I've created a valid copy of whatever you want, right? Probably my magic card collection, I'm a nerd, right? You know, or then you also have proof of space time. 
sort of that's where I can prove as a storage provider that I continue to store that valid copy. And I've kind of locked myself into saying that it's still the Magic Card Collection, right? You know, for some data for some period of time. It's you're proving that you're still doing that. Those are the key concepts at like a very, very high level, but still I think useful to understand. So now we're into calculating collateral, right? So basically, like, why do we do that? Like, why do you have to stake? What do you have to do? What does this all mean? Why is there a piggy bank here, right? It means that like, how do I ensure good economic behavior? That's really all that collateral ever does in various shapes or form. Whether the bank asks you to post collateral, whether your digital asset exchange asks you to post collateral, whether Robinhood does, like you're just aligning economic incentives and ensuring that if something were to go bad, that counterparty has a way to act on it, has a way to protect themselves. And that's something that's very important, especially if we're in a sort of distributed environment. Right? The purpose is to ensure that everyone acts in good faith, faith, faith um, you know, or their stake is reduced. Right now, one thing that's pretty cool about Filecoin, someone like me, really don't like that. You know, here's our 365 days rather than 360. Is that the sectors for Filecoin, the sort of time span for this, range from 180 or 540 days. It's great if you're like me and you're super old school, because uh, most of the old finance calculations usually for like bond or interest payments, something else from like long, long time ago, were dated in 360 day years. So that's pretty cool. I love that. Um, but as we've kind of alluded to, the network will penalize you, right, by forfeit, by making you forfeit part of your rewards, right, if you fail on any one of these posts, like posting, proof of space time, right? Now we're, we're going to go through, for the next couple slides, basically how to calculate, you know, collateral, what, is, what does it mean to commit capacity, and these can all get technical. So as an overview, something that like I think is really important is that the precise amounts in any one moment in time are not useful for a presentation. They'll be useful for you as a storage provider as you go out and win deals, as you go and understand the market, but it's better to understand, at least from my perspective, right, the principles behind them. So one of the things I'd wanna say for this, for collateral needed to commit capacity, is that Filecoin also uses upfront token collaterals as in proof of stake protocols. What this means is that it's harder to attack or control the network. That's something that any blockchain would want to do. So there are three big types of collateral that you need. First is your initial pledge collateral. That's what you need to participate in the economy. The second is what you get as a block reward, what you get as a storage provider. And then finally, you sort of have the storage deal collateral. So what you negotiate with a customer, with a client. So the initial pledge collateral is something akin to, to use a physical example, like you know, say Airbnb, right? It's the deposit you put down, right? To ensure that you go on the network. Now what you can see here, and I trust your ability to read, is that there's a calculation sitting behind it. And while the overall amount of that deposit, of that initial pledge, will change over time, it's something that you can model out, which I think is important as a finance person, because you can sort of see different scenarios for what it means, but it also depends on something key, which is like the amount of power added by the network and the network circulating supply. These are two key components, which are which giving you precise numbers now, not necessarily useful, but understanding the mechanics behind them, I think make it easier for someone to understand what's going on or to like in layman's terms, why is this number so big? Understanding that is a key way for understanding why the number is so big. Now we're at block rewards as collateral. This is what you get, right, for doing your job. It's great. So one of the key things that makes it different though is that you don't get all of your block rewards immediately. It's something you'll see also on the next slide too. Basically what happens is you get it, right, but it's also subject to that same sort of performance incentive that we've talked about before. If something bad were to happen, or if I'm default on my performance, some of those block rewards go away, which makes sense, it feels fair. Aligning incentives are important, and it's a big theme in the network. What you'll see on the next slide sort of is storage provider deal collateral. That's the collateral you'd get, right, for negotiating deals, right? Say I'd have it with the Shoah Foundation or with a private university to, to make it less specific, right? This is a way you can differentiate yourself. Higher collateral might be a way to, say, to indicate to the market different levels of service. I'm better able to store your data. All these sort of things are important right, and sort of understanding what's going on. So now we're on useful sources of Filecoin, like useful sources. So one of the ways I think to learn more 
is to go out into the market and see what the community is making with it. See other, other ways outside of linearly lead, reading white papers, you know, what else, you know, reading white papers, mm, other, like other things. There are other areas where you can learn. Um, two of the areas I found the most, I guess the most useful are fgas.io and Philvox. Like these are areas akin to like if you're you know financially savvy or you come from a finance background like I do, sort of like Bloomberg, FactSet, providing real time information on pricing, you know, on collateral, right? That that matters. That's important. Now I'm not going to be like a Filecoin trader where I have to go buy or sell or you know I'm screaming over the phone like oh the market's going down or something like that. But it's just useful to have quality, consistent information, especially if I'm going out there trying to build my business trying to forecast demand, or just because I might come from an underwriting background, just different scenarios depending on how the cost of collateral changes or how the price of Filecoin impacts my business. These areas are both really, really useful. What we'll go through is fgas.io right, is useful, at least in my mind currently, for collateral and gas fees. Right, the sort of, on the one hand, basically the amount you'll need to post, right, you know, or that consensus pledge, Right, and then also the gas fee is sort of how much you need, right, or how much you'll burn, right, as you're operating on the network. Philfox, on the other hand, has a wider variety of metrics, as you can see. Now, what I have up here on the slide, a little stale, but it can be super useful, or at least very cool to understand what the block reward is, you know, mining over a 24-hour period, right? How many active miners there are, right? Like those things, like. It's, I, I couldn't do this if I was in an energy background. I couldn't see how much oil was actually being taken out of the ground. I couldn't see when I was operating a wind farm or managing it, excuse me, like how many kilowatts, right? Or how many megawatts we generated in real time. This was all in the future. And the great part is that revolution is here now. Super cool. So now we're on to calculating block rewards, sort of again, how we make our money, right? One of the things that, that probably will lead to a question in, in, in a little bit later, is are block rewards decrementing over time? Are they going down? You know, What does that mean for the future of the network? And I promise we'll answer that. But one of the key things, kind of like what we were doing with Collateral, you know, rather than give you a precise answer right, that will rapidly be obsolete, is that the average block reward is quite simply the total Filecoin minted divided by the total network capacity. Now those are, those are two big numbers to understand, so let's break it down. The total Filecoin minted is a function of the amount minted the prior day to a power, to like a power of negative decay. Okay, so beyond beyond that, beyond the the traumatic times in algebra when I had to go do exponential decay functions again, liberal arts major, right? That means that it's going down, right? That numerator, but the denominator, network size, is if we do our jobs as the network grows, should go up, right? Over time, simple math. That means that number is going down. That overall block reward. Now here, I'll go pretty fast because it's something that I've mentioned before. It's that you know block rewards have a vesting schedule. Something that if you work at a startup, also kind of makes sense. You know, although it's a little better. Twenty-five percent of the rewards vest immediately, and the other seventy-five percent vest over time, right? And again, you can see at the bottom, it's something that we can play with a little later, even during the internship period. There's like a block reward calculator, and that's really cool for simulating certain things. And I really am a big fan of of using a tool like that to help you understand more. So again, we're back to that, that big so what question, right? And I'll read it for the sake of everyone else, right? If block rewards decline over time, how does Filecoin sustain itself without the incentive for storage providers? Great question. I think it's fundamental to the network. It's one of the first ones I had too, but I think this answer that we're providing is pretty satisfactory, right? So what's gonna end up happening is that yes, block rewards will go away. But if demand from clients, from the outside world, from the area outside of our little island is so strong that mining is still profitable via those deal fees, right? then you don't need the block rewards. The block rewards have done their job. They've bootstrapped themselves and let the economy grow and let it touch the outside world. I think that's important for me because that's something where if we only were to live on block rewards, and maybe I'm editorializing a little bit, I don't see how it would grow that much larger. I don't see how you do anything else but necessarily be a storage provider. Right? Doing those deals, doing those other things, I think are fundamental to the economy and to like the protocol's growth. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna touch on two things, both storage deal pricing and retrieval deal pricing. 
So those things are a little hard to go through, let's say, in depth, right? Because it's going to be up to you as a storage provider to negotiate. But I think it's fair to say that there are no predefined prices and that you can be as creative as you want. Now, I, and this is recorded, so I guess you can quote me on that. But there will be a market clearing price for each storage deal, and there are going to be ways that you can differentiate yourself, both on like pricing and on cost. And that's where it becomes an actual market. And that feels cool, right? And that's a little ahead of sort of the retrieval market, what we're going to talk about in a little bit. So the retrieval deal pricing is something, as you can see, I'm again borrowing from that 2020 white paper I told you all to read. Um, it's a little bit less advanced, a little bit more nascent than the storage market, right? Because we haven't necessarily had to do this at scale. But it should operate like something similar, right? The same sort of key things that drive the retrieval market are going to be pricing, popularity, locality, and latency. And hopefully, because of Filecoin, there will be other areas that will it'll continue to distinguish itself. Finally, we're wrapping up with sort of verified storage deals. You'll see it sometimes as fill plus. Right? So verified storage deals are a further incentive layer to, to post or store quality data on the network. So there, there's like a very simple, simple math here, is that you earn 10x the block rewards, but you also have to post 10 times the collateral. So very linear, you know, increased risk, increased rewards. And the whole goal of this, and the reason why you have this incentive, is that there aren't just ways, I'm not just storing, again, you know, blank copies of my Magic Card collection to, to stay with a the theme, you know, but we're storing actual, verified, useful data. And the way that verification me mechanism works is also through a distributed consensus. So you like, it's not, it, it would feel weird Right? It would feel strange if we're doing all this work to have a decentralized storage economy, right? but at the same time, in order to get the most rewards or in order to store the most precious data, you had to go through a centralized interface. That would feel strange. It's not the case. Now, there are other examples you may learn, and you'll probably hear about in ESPA, of various verified deals. They can come from universities, they can come from various locations, but they all follow that similar, very large economic incentive. So here we're at the end of our presentation. Thanks so much for joining and listening in. Hopefully we've done a little bit to shed a light on the Filecoin economy.